Well, that's the first part of our caribou sequence in Quebec. Now you can see some of the problems. I took my bow and arrow, we were with a group of bow hunters. After four days, we had taken one cow caribou, and that was it. There's so much of an expanse up in caribou country, and the caribou like to stay out in the open, much like wild turkeys like to be out in the middle of a field where they're hard to get to. The caribou's survival is being out in the open and being in a herd. They don't travel like deer. They don't have runways through the trees that they sneak through where you can set up and ambush them. This is why a lot of the bow hunters prefer, well, the Shefferville area used to be an area where these caribou would come through in migrations, massive migrations. There, you could see the runways, you could see where they were going to come through, and in a few years ago, you could predict those migrations. So the bow hunters could sit along there and just have a steady stream of caribou to choose from. Nowadays, the caribou in Quebec tend to move around from area to area. The migrations aren't well defined like they used to be, and some of the better hunting is farther north than Shefferville, where those resident herds are moving around, and that's where we were hunting with Safari Nordique. Now, a couple questions you might have. What about um, Oh, small game hunting. What about fishing? Okay, we showed you some fishing. You saw just about all the fishing we did. A lot of people bring their fishing tackle. They have great expectations, but you're spending a lot of money for a hunt. Uh, fishing is not a priority. They don't have the boats, and people just aren't in the mood to go fishing when you're up there. And, and for some reason, even in Alaska, the fishing at that time of year in those kind of lakes can be really hit and miss. I wouldn't put, if I were you, go ahead, bring your, if you're going the first time, you're going to do it anyway. Bring your rod and reel, but I guarantee you, you won't use it like you planned on using it. Uh, some other things, small game hunting, that's sort of like fishing when you're on a caribou hunt. You really want to focus on those caribou. In Quebec, you're allowed two caribou, so you might want to maybe do a little bit of trophy hunting. You're going to want to look for a big one. Let's see here. I got some notes that I've taken down during my trips. Some of these I've written down on my way back of things to remember. Oh, judging distance. Oh. What a problem in the tundra. It's hard to tell. Sometimes a distance is much farther than you think it is, especially if it's at close range. That's something you think is, oh, that's 30 yards away, pace it off. It's 50 or 60. Then you look at another distance, you say, well, that must be a mile over there to that clump of trees. You walk it, it's a quarter of a mile, not nearly as far as you think. So you're going to have some trouble judging distance in the tundra. That makes bow hunting quite difficult. Now, I'm not down on bow hunting for caribou. But ambushing a caribou with a bow is tough, getting him that close. Uh, you really need to be in some type of wooded area. You're going to see a lot more of them out in the open than you will in, uh, in these wooded areas. So let's see, we covered Shefferville. The migrations aren't what they used to be, fishing, bow hunting. Well, let's take a look at a shot at a caribou. What you're going to see has created somewhat of a controversy among viewers and among bow hunters. But this is the shot I had, I think it was after three or four days of hunting three days I think it was, and that's the only shot I was able to get. The tundra south of Ungava Bay in northern Quebec is the land of the caribou. To the Inuit Indians, they're a source of food, and the herd in this part of Canada has been growing, some say too much for their own good. Hunters are allowed to take two caribou in an effort to trim the herd and balance with the long-term food supply. Traditionally, caribou have migrated en masse from summering grounds to wintering areas. But 150 miles west of Kujak, part of the herd has become somewhat resident, migrating back and forth, wandering. And this is where the camps of Safari Nordique are located. Caribou are plentiful. Each morning, our guide, Al Higley, originally from Hunt, New York, would shuttle us an hour from camp to a prime caribou crossing. Birds this far north aren't too common except for the grouse-like ptarmigan. A few bow hunters in our camp brought back ptarmigan for dinner, quite an accomplishment with a bow. hard it is to get a ptarmigan dinner with a bow and arrow. <laughs> Crying out loud, I missed that. I missed them. Shot all my arrows twice. Ten times so far. <laughs> Very close. 
I could have chased ptarmigan all day, but we were there for caribou, and we had prepared excellent blinds for the camera and for hunting. We've seen several herds of caribou come from over the hill here, and I'm down in the valley that's right next to the river. You can see from John's camera blind the setting of this little clump of trees. Uh, they seem to cross from the other hill. Now, I'm sitting in a clump of spruces in here, which is just a beautiful little blind. I have my what I'm wearing, of course, my hat with a bill on it because they keep the rain off of my glasses is a real problem. Suit has a hood, which is a lifesaver for keeping warm, keeping my back to the wind whenever I can. This is a Gore-Tex suit, which you need for the rain protection, including the rain pants. And my boots, have to use Arctic ice fishing type of boots with felt liners. Got my bow here over against a uh, limb. I don't knock an arrow until I see a caribou because there's no real need to, because uh, geez, the visibility is great. I sit over here on, a, on my bucket, which also keeps things dry, has a swivel seat. Uh, my mittens I put on when I'm cold, otherwise I'm ready for some action. Now this blind, the reason that we put it right here is out in front you can see crisscrossing trails, many trails from where the caribou crossed the river. You can see behind me from the camera blind uh, a trail coming across here. In fact, John's camera blind is right up the hill. It's right almost on the crest of the hill and he's hunkered down so the caribou can't see him. It's a perfect setting caribou crossing from many directions and uh, hopefully we'll get one today i hope we sat and waited and then suddenly but quietly they appeared they're going to they're going to win me the wind is blowing towards them let's see what happens 70 yards away directly downwind, the bull either sees us or wins us. He wants to come down to the lower plateau where I'm waiting with my bow and John Ford is behind me with a camera. While white-tailed deer rely heavily on their noses to detect danger, it's my conclusion that caribou rely far more on their eyes. Motion in the trees puts them at a distance. Your scent in the air, at least according to my experience, doesn't spook them nearly as much as you'd think. We had caribou around us for at least 15 minutes, but our moving in the blind, trying to adjust for better camera angles must have been noticeable. Once one caribou was suspicious, the rest were on edge. Maybe we'd have better luck tomorrow. The next day, I was full of anticipation. In fact, too full. I sat in the blind hour after hour, glassing, watching, scanning, and saw nothing, but I had a theory. All those caribou that descended on the blind the evening before had to come from that plateau above. My curiosity was killing me. I wanted to explore that plateau on my own to see if I couldn't find a better spot for John and I to sit. While I stalked the caribou on the plateau, John stayed back at the camera blind, overlooking my empty blind. That's the clump of trees on the left. Can you believe this luck? All I would have had to do was be patient. Not 20 minutes after I left my blind, a large herd of caribou grazed its way up that valley by my blind, walked right past cameraman John Ford on the hill. They walked downwind from John not 20 yards. He was excited, and they seemed only curious. There's my blind, empty. I left my vests and heavy clothing sitting there, not a half hour old, not 10 feet from those caribou. They sauntered by on both sides. What does that tell you about patience? Well, after cruising by the blind that I so carefully prepared, the whole herd passed by John. This one, he says, should have winded him. It was downwind about 12 yards away. Perhaps it did, but it wasn't terribly frightened. Forty-five minutes later, I was back in the blind, and towards dark, I spotted two small bulls working along the river. I'd have to get closer for a shot, so I made a stalk. One spotted me, 
and I had a split second to make a running shot. All in all, I was pretty darn close. I think Fred Bear would have been proud of me. That arrow, as you can see, may have even bumped that bull's antlers. If not, it was just a whisker away. Was I disappointed? No, I was excited. I had a chance, and I came close. To me, that was a thrill with a bow and arrow, but not as big a thrill. As you'll see next week, I move in on this record book bull across that marsh and up that hillside. That's coming up next week in Caribou, the final episode.